Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 17th of September 2014. Welcome to everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for your support. Really appreciate it. I'm currently in London. Um, we'll be in Ukraine within a few days. So maybe go and do some interviews over there or just at least keep an eye on the situation anyway. Um, today's news. Both sides in the Scottish referendum debate are making their final pitch at the moment to voters on the last day of campaigning. Uh, the latest polls have shown that it's neck and neck, uh, sort of 50-50. I can't help thinking that after seeing how desperate the Westminster elite are over this issue, that they're, they're not going to let people vote um, yes. Uh, whether via vote rigging, pulling in favours from various people, which they've been doing anyway. Um, you know, they've been asking uh, bankers, uh, nuclear power uh, leaders and um, all manner of different types of people, people in the military to stand up and say, no, you can't do this. So, um, but I think if if they get any wind that there's any chance, they will they will do something. They're not going to let this happen. But I really hope it does happen. If it does happen, then great. I, I um, I support Scotland in whatever decision they make. But I really hope they make the obvious decision, which is to get the hell away from the Westminster elite. Well, I mean, whether Alex Salmond uh, has good intentions, I, I honestly don't know. But he couldn't possibly be worse than the guys in Westminster at the moment. And they've shown their true colours um, and their desperation in trying to scare, manipulate Scottish voters. I mean, Cameron's speech, I think, that he gave recently reveals so much about their governments and the methods of control. Threatening economic collapse. No return if they say yes. No help from consulates abroad, no protection from ISIS. When in fact, if Scotland left ISIS, they would probably be a lot safer. They wouldn't be associated with um, with England really, and with the military and with Cameron. So they'd actually be safer. Um, I hope people can see through this, and I think they probably can. Um, in an open letter to the Sun newspaper, 14 former armed forces chiefs said a no vote on Thursday's referendum was critical for their security. Um, they're obviously looking after their own interests too, and most of the people standing up and speaking out against the, um, the yes campaign have their own agendas. It's been really nice though to see the Westminster guys um, squirming. I'm talking about Cameron and all the uh, leaders of the other parties. And I've noticed a lot of NLP going on as well, neuro-linguistic programming, careful, carefully worded speech, because that's all these guys do is just read speeches that are written to them by other people. Nothing comes from the heart. So when uh, Cameron says he's going to be heartbroken, well, I don't think he will be heartbroken. He might be a bit annoyed that he might lose some kind of um, interests um, and uh, finances himself, but you know he's not going to be heartbroken. Not for the people of Scotland, that's for sure. He's just lying. But then I, I noticed he used uh, phrases like the family of nations. Now, not many people use that phrase when they talk about the UK. So why suddenly drag that, dig that out of the bag? I mean, it's the same ploy that Coca-Cola use when they stick sis and bro and family on their coke cans because people are supposed to associate that with things they love hence they're going to then feel, have feelings of love towards coca-cola um, and they're trying the same thing I hate that kind of stuff and I think it should probably be banned to be honest um, deliberate manipulation um, it's just it's not nice anyway um, or at least make people aware of it, of, aware of what's going on. And to be honest, if you're Prime Minister, just speak from the heart, say what you think. Stop getting people to write everything for you, you know. Um, okay, and Obama and Cameron have been focusing on the ISIS threat as well. Um, uh, looking for any form of action or law that would have previously raised eyebrows but continuously referring to ISIS, saying we need to do this because of ISIS. Take away freedom of speech, 
um, take away privacy, all because of ISIS and the threat which Cameron said could go on for decades. Um, we'll talk about that later with Anthony, uh, formerly from the University of Bill Kent, but now moved to a, another university, which I mentioned last week and I'll mention again later. Um, also, Ebola has been big in the news this week. President Obama has called um, the West Africa Ebola outbreak a threat to global security. So here's another threat, here's another, another thing to worry about. Um, he, and he announced a larger US role in fighting the virus, including sending 3,000 US troops to the region. Now, that's more than the amount of people who've died so far, in my, uh, as far as I'm aware. It's very peculiar. I don't trust the reason why um, he's doing this. I, I, my, my alarms always go off whenever they do something uh, uh, because they say they care then there's something going on because they don't care. So why is he sending 3,000 US troops to the region? Could he be? Uh, could they be collecting samples to bring back to cull the, the population, the rest of us basically? Um, anyone who thinks that that's ridiculous and a conspiracy theory, just listen, listen to some people talking. Listen to Prince Philip, Bill Gates, um, Ted Turner. Um, a, lot, a lot of people, um, you know, po population has been deemed as um, getting out of control and they they would actually feel they'll be doing some good by culling um, sort of you know some people say 15 20 percent I think that was um, Bill Gates who mentioned 15 percent um, others uh, like if you look at the Georgia Guidestones I think uh, they're talking more like 90 percent so uh, you know the Ebola virus could be a concern but um, I'm very suspicious about what those troops are going to be doing over there um, a trial of the experimental vaccine against the Ebola virus is to begin in Oxford um, today, I believe. Now, um, it's it's very strange because there's a, there was has been a number of companies that um, were asked to um, work on vaccines for the Ebola virus yeah, in the sort of up to seven years ago, seven or eight years ago, and they just um, perfected their uh, antidote and vaccines. Um, in the same year that the worst ever case of Ebola broke out. I'm sure it's just coincidence, of course. Um, anyway, they're either going to do this to cull the population a bit, or they're going to do it to raise money, create fear, create panic, and then start selling the uh, pharmaceutical industry solutions to the problem. Um, I noticed in Thailand, um, I, I keep a bit of an eye on Thailand, as obviously because I, I travel there quite a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been a murder um, in Thailand on a, a beach resort, Koh Tao, I think it was, uh, two British people killed. And um, I noticed straight away they were saying um, uh, they were focusing all their attentions, not on British people or uh, foreigners or Thais, but on the Burmese immigrants. That's because the Thais pretty much hate the Burmese immigrants and um, th there, there has been plenty of cases in the past where they've actually pinned um, crimes uh, on the Burmese uh, people who happen to be there. It's a bit of a corrupt um, police system in Thailand too, you know, as it's probably a bit of an understatement. I do love Thailand, love the people, love the food, love the beaches, but um, and actually the police don't tend to borrow, uh, bother foreigners, but um, yeah, they're pretty corrupt anyway. As they are in a lot of other countries, of course. Um, I heard Julia Toriansky talking about anarchy last week, and um, I, I, in the past I've always thought, you know, anarchy, some nice ideas, but um, actually in practice it wouldn't work. But um, I was quite impressed with what Julie was saying about it. I saw her on um, uh, Alex Jones as well. So uh, I've contacted her and I hope that she may come on uh, at the end of this month anyway to talk to us as well about um, anarchy, about Bitcoin, about the dark web and um, lots of other issues as well. Another person I'm hoping to come on, uh, who will be coming on actually, sorry, is uh, Sheila Zielinski, if anyone listens to Hagman and Hagman. 
she'll probably be on yeah she will be on next episode um so um if you know Sheila Zielinski, tune in for that next week. Okay, um, the t-shirts have arrived, so I just wanted to say there's two ways uh, to win a free t-shirt over the next three months, and uh, say Christmas time, and that is um, a free t-shirt to the person with the most interesting one and a half minute voice comment, uh, which is uh, which you can do on the voicemail system we've set up. Now to get to it, first of all, you need to make sure you're on the Truth Sentinel channel on YouTube. There are other sites that put in our videos up and we're very grateful for that. But if you need to use any of the facilities like the voicemail, the chat room, uh, make a donation, you need to make sure you come to our channel, which is uh, Truth Sentinel. You type it into Google, it'll either come up as Truth Sentinel um, or Truth Sentinel 2. Actually, Truth Sentinel is the main channel. Truth Sentinel 2 is a channel with a lot of subscribers, but um, Unfortunately, I need to ask you if you are listening on that channel to subscribe to Truth Sentinel, not Truth Sentinel 2, as uh, we had some problems with that channel and um, we can only upload the videos onto the Truth Sentinel channel. And um, also, if you type in things like Scott Sentinel, Scott Sentinel 9, Truth Sentinel on YouTube, you'll find it. And basically, um, you can donate on there if you want to get a t-shirt just donate um, I'm taking it down to 20 28 pounds at the moment yeah so I'm using that old catalyst trick of knocking knocking two pounds off so it sounds a lot cheaper when in fact it's only two pounds cheaper but never mind um anyway so the competition is to whoever can come up with the most interesting informative or even funny comment over the next three months on the voicemail system Please use that. Um, you click on the icon at the top right of the uh, the page. You'll go to the about section, and you'll actually see it says voice message. Try and find that if you can. You can always hit pause now and go and have a look for that. Find the chat room. It'd be great if people started using that because I'd like to make the channel more interactive. Also, to anyone who does a publicity stunt that brings in the mo uh, the most new listeners. Make a video of it, take a screenshot of whatever you've done, or take a photo, send it to us and you'll get a free t-shirt too over the next uh, So that competition lasts over the next three months as well. Um, yeah, please do you do use the chat room, the voicemail, donate if you can. And um, last episode we were joined, we, uh, we joined up with Pete Wicker, The Truth is Stranger Than Fiction. And we hope to join him again at some point, probably when I'm in Ukraine. I'm going to Ukraine this week, so may do a report or two from there. Today we're joined by a very special lady, uh, Jasvinda Sangira. Type her into Google um, if you want, and ha you'll find out that uh, she's listed by the Guardian newspaper as one of the top 100 most inspirational women in the world. Um, Prime Minister David Cameron said that... Um, Sangira sort of um, caught his attention about forced marriages and uh, it was due to her campaigning and relentless lobbying of government uh, to criminalise forced marriage that it was finally announced um, in the 2012 Queen's speech that forced marriage would become a specific criminal offence in England and Wales. Um, so that law has now come into being, I believe. Um, and regardless of um, of the accolades uh, she's achieved, I mean, it's quite obvious that she's doing a lot of good work. Um, and we're very glad that she came and spoke to us. She's um, The accolade she has got is the Woman of the Year Award 2007, Pride of Britain Award 2009, Global Punjabi Society Award 2012, Cosmopolitan Wonder Woman Award 2010, Inspirational Woman of the Year Award 2008, Asian Woman Achievement Award 2007, Ambassador for Peace Award 2008. So um, she's quite a lady anyway. Um, and let's go and listen to the interview. We're talking about honour killings and forced marriages. Honour killings, uh, you may have heard in the news. And if you come from say a more western culture you might not be familiar as to why they occur and 
Um, it, it, I just thought it would be good to chat to someone about this and find out a little bit about the honor system. And, you know, if we can do anything to help, it would be great. So here we go. Um, and let's listen to the interview. Hello, Jasvinda. Hello. Hello. Welcome to uh, Truth Sentinel. Good to be here. Thanks very much for coming on and um, speaking to us today about this topic. And um, I thought we could start off with the concept of honour or bringing shame upon a family because a, a lot of people from Western families probably don't um, understand that, the actual concept itself. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, first of all, I'll, I'll speak from personal experience with somebody who experienced an honour system and lived the whole life around fearing, dishonouring the family, shaming them, and if I did, it would have put me at risk. So I'd just explain my own experience in relation to it for people to understand. Um, I was born in Britain. I'm one of seven sisters. I have one brother. And growing up as a girl was very different to growing up as a boy. Um, I very quickly understood from a very young age, from the age of five years old, how girls had the uh, position of more or less being subservient, in all honesty, to my brother, to the men in the family. And as we got older, we learnt how we had to be modest and dress modestly. We had to um, tie our hair back and you know, we couldn't cut our hair. Then when we got into adolescence, as a young teenager, we understood we couldn't wear makeup, we couldn't speak to white people, and that's what my family would say, we couldn't integrate. and. We couldn't go to a school disco, let alone date a boy, we couldn't even talk to a boy. All these things were regarded as shameful, dishonorable behaviors, and we were chaperoned everywhere, not allowed to go out on our own and do things that could attract attention, the attention being something shameful towards the family. So the kind of things that people take for granted every single day in terms of your freedom, your right, the right to even marry who you want to, the right to an education and have aspirations, the right to experiment with makeup and your sexuality, all those things were deemed dishonorable. And if you did them, then you put yourself at risk. You were at risk of being um, emotionally abused, um, physically abused. You put yourself at risk of significant harm, being forced into a marriage. And, of course, if you look at cases like Cecilia Ahmed, who was murdered by both of her parents in 2003, she was actually murdered. So they deemed her to be too westernized, dishonoring the family, and she was killed. So it's a system that exists within a family, and it doesn't exist in isolation. Many family members uphold it. Many women, I have to say as well, they uphold it. Men can enforce it. Women can enforce it. It exists not just in the family, but in the community. You become the eyes and the ears to that girl, that person reporting back to the family if they think she's behaving dishonorably. So you're not an independent person. You live your whole life adhering to codes of honor and fearing breaching codes for the fear of what could happen to you. And that's, I've tried to break it down in the most simplest terms try and describe it to you and that Carmen Ivana, the charity that I founded, every victim caller to the helpline that rings us, and we have over 800 calls a month, has an experience of an honor based system within their family. And why, why, do the, um, why do these families care so much about what other families think about them? Is it connected to religion or is it connected to the social, the social makeup of that particular type of society? I, the, 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 what families really care about in terms of the honor system and what it does to a family is it upholds their reputation. So we have the power to dishonor our family. That means the dent in the reputation of the family. Because if your daughters behave according to an honor system, well, then you have a very good reputation as a family. And if your your daughter is upholding the traditions of the family, of which one is, an arranged marriage, I'm not talking about a forced marriage, and she says, well, actually, I don't want to have an arranged marriage. I want to marry, you know, somebody I want to marry. Um, then it almost is received as they're going against tradition. Um, and as for religion, well, actually, religion talks about freedom and independence and protection. So it's not religion, but very often the victims are ingrained 
to believe that they are a bad Muslim or a bad Sikh or a bad Hindu if they go against an honor system. So the family are worried that, again, you know, they could be perceived as raising uh, dishonorable children who don't uphold the religion the way they perceive it or traditions. And again, it goes back to the reputation. That's the issue. The caring about what other people think comes before your own children. And the way to explain that is, so I think about my sister Rubina, uh, it was her birthday on September the 9th, actually. She would have been 51 years old. She took her own life and set herself on fire in her very early 20s. Now, my family's view was it was better for Rubina to take her life than for her to divorce her husband. And that is very sick, but it's a reality. Because in the community sense, a woman divorcing her husband, in this particular community, my community, which was actually a Sikh community, I have to say, it was awfully shameful for you to divorce your husband. The psychology of it's better to take your life than to do that. You can imagine how strong it is. Yeah, I mean, when I, when I heard the story about your sister, it, it did make me feel a, a bit ill. It was just so horrible. I mean, is it your sister's death that helps motivate you to keep, to keep campaigning yeah. about this as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Rubina's death, that was her name. Rubina's death was actually the trigger for me to own the fact that I wasn't this horrible perpetrator that had dishonored her family. I finally owned that this had been done to me. Actually, I was the victim. I haven't betrayed my family and dishonored you guys. You've made me feel that and made me internalize that as guilt and shame. You did this to me and rubina has gone now. So her death enabled me to break my silence and come out of hiding and go back to my hometown in Derby and develop a project. The project, Carmen of Honor, is there because of her memory. It was founded in 1993 and it lives on to reach women like Rubina who was so isolated, who actually put this honor system before making a, a life choice to leave your husband. That was the more important thing because she'd been ingrained to believe that. So the, the role of common of honor is breaking silences and reaching the most isolated people who fundamentally do not have the support of their families. Their families send them back to perpetrators because of honor. And did you ever uh, con contemplate suicide yourself in your own situation? I did, yes, as a um, teenager, 15-year-old girl who was being told, uh, you are going to marry this man in this photograph. I mean, I was told that at 14, actually. But it really honed in at 15 because that's when the pressure really mounted. So I attempted suicide by swallowing tablets. My, my family knew that, and uh, they didn't allow me to seek any medical attention. I was given lots of coffee and told to walk up and down in the living room. And um, later on in my life, again, I attempted suicide in the same way as a teenager, again, because I, I was missing my family terribly. When you are, um, you make that decision to leave your family, sadly, majority of them, in terms of the victims, certainly for me, are faced with being ostracized by their family. And I was disowned and made to feel this horrible human being, and I missed them terribly. While I was reading about um, about you, I came across um, one case where you were talking about um, a girl who'd been repeatedly raped by her new husband, and uh, she was allowed to come back to the UK to sponsor her husband's application for a visa. And she right. she begged her mum for help in, uh, when when she came back, and her mum said it's your duty to stay with him even though he's beaten sure. her. Uh, and she yeah. said if if you have to die in that marriage, you die. Mm. Um, to me, that there's such a detachment there, and I, I, I can't quite understand. Like, is there a concept of love in these families to start off with? I mean, is there a feelings of love towards their sons and daughters? Because it just seems like how 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 you could go from some sending sure. someone to school, hugs, yeah, you know, saying positive things, and then to this kind of level, yeah. it just seems. You know, <laughs> Take it back a step, and how you can go from giving birth to somebody and then mm. doing that to them. Um, no, you're absolutely right. It's incomprehensible because you you feel that because you are a decent human being that actually knows right from wrong. And, you know, in with respect to that mother, the justifications that she's making are not good enough. She is reinforcing the honor system and the code where she could be somebody who actually instigates to change and decides, well, I'm not going to let my daughter go through with this. You're right. That is not an isolated case. We hear cases like that all the time on the helpline. 
where girls are taken abroad, passports taken off them, they are forced to marry, so they're repeatedly raped. They come over here, then families force them to sponsor these foreign nationals into this country. And they are, you know, they use pressure, force, they even use coercion, they'll say things like, well, just call him over here and then, you know, get him to become a British subject and then, you know, you can leave him. But that isn't true because it just goes on and on. Then you've got to have kids and it goes on and on. So the mothers should be breaking the cycle and, you know, there is nothing in Islam, Sikhism, Hinduism or tradition that says that is acceptable. In fact, it says the opposite. Would the mothers be scared themselves of any repercussions if they did say anything? Well, sure. I, I maybe they would be scared themselves. Um, the key perpetrators in my life were not men. They were women. It was my mother. She was a key perpetrator. And my sisters also. You know, my father could say, was well, he turned a blind eye. But in terms of who was enforcing the physical punishment and the, the emotional abuse, it was my mother. Um but you know, she was married as a as a young uh, teenager herself. You know, she was under the age of sixteen. But she could have said, "I want different for my children." You know, we were born in Britain. You know, we went to school here. My mother was born in India. You know, th th we do have the power to say, "Actually, we're not doing this for our kids anymore." But I can do that with my own children today. They will never inherit that legacy of abuse because I ran away from home. They were to inherit it. That these women have got to stand up and be counted and speak out against this. They do have a choice. I accept they might, it might take courage. They may be fearful of the repercussions from within their family, from the community. So what is the alternative? You watch your daughter suffer horrific abuse or even take her own life or die. And did you think your mother or did your mother display any kind of pain about the fact that your sister killed herself? No. Um, actually, when Rabina died, my mother's health deteriorated within 18 months and within around three and a half years, she died. And on her deathbed, um, I, I actually had to negotiate being allowed to go to the hospital because my mother, even on her deathbed, didn't want me to be in the same room where the family were coming because I was the horrible secret. But I refused to leave her, her bed when she was dying. You know, so here you have in the hospice, she's got cancer, the doctor said she will die in the next few hours and my mother's telling me to leave before people get there, which I refuse to do. But her dying words, I don't know if anybody has ever heard anybody die, but they have like a rattle, they call it the death rattle. Mm. Before she died, her last words were, in Zimbabwe, Rabina, I'm coming to you. So she never spoke about my sister for all those years. Her health deteriorated, but they were her last words. So she always carried it with her. But, was not able to show that because if my mother, like with me, I'm discerned, if my family had accepted me back into their fold in that community, the community would have cast aspersions on them. How can you allow your runaway daughter to come back? What example is that setting to the rest of the community and the other girls might get ideas? Same with Rabina, you know, she, she took her own life. I heard people say it was a better option than for her to divorce her husband. If my mother had spoken about that, Again, those people in the community may have come out and said, well, how would it have been better if I did to divorce her husband? Do you see what I'm saying? So mm. th they're constantly thinking about what people think. You know, in the local Godwara, the local church, where my mother is in really sick from she used to go to the local church, the women, I used to call it the gossip shop, because the, the women in there, the little girl going up, oh, she used to be talking about so-and-so's daughter and so-and-so's daughter, and have you seen that girl down the road? Causing shit on that. Have you heard that girl run away from her? See what I'm saying? Mm. <laughs> this, this, this constant, like, um, bickering that goes on and it's rooted in notions of how intact is your reputation and if it isn't, we're throwing stones at you. Do you think some people use religion as an excuse to, uh, to abuse and control people yeah. when in fact they're always, they yeah. always were an abuser and, and controlling type of person? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. And we can say that about Christianity through centuries as well, where religion is used as a tool to oppress people. And it's certainly a safe to say in these cases. And I know that because that happened to me personally. I I used to um, go to the local um, Sikh temple with my mother. You know, I didn't really understand what they were saying when they were reading from the Sikh Bible. But equally, faith leaders were not saying this is wrong. You know, it's wrong to treat a daughter like this. So it's wrong for sure 
children into marriage. So there was no counter message other than the message my mother was telling me, which was, you have to marry who we say because it's written in the Sikh Bible. So mm -hmm. how can I challenge that if I'm being indoctrinated to believe that? And if you did something wrong, you know, same with a lot of the Muslim people who are in the helpline, they will say to us, I'm a bad Muslim because I'm disobeying my parents and I should obey them. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They will use it in a way in order to mis manipulate our victims instead of allowing the religion, which is what the, we need to be doing, and this is what we do with victims, is empower it, can you can use it to empower you? Because your religion fundamentally speaks out against abuse, against forced marriage, against murder. So it's a difficult transition when you've been indoctrinated and conditioned to believe that this religion means you have to abide by an honor code or uh, behave in a certain way. And all of a sudden, somebody's saying to you, well, actually, you don't, because that was wrong. There's no counter-message for these people who are indoctrinated. And you learn your rights and wrongs from your family. So if your, your parents are saying this to you, you take it as almost as the word of God. Yeah, I mean, you're right that it's not just about the Sikh religion. There's um, it's, it's about there's there's lots of problems in all religions, really. I mean, sure. a, a lot of organized sure. religions have, have kind of like a hierarchy, and um, it often seems like people are making the rules rather than rather than these were the rules that you can find in maybe the text or people yeah. are interpreting the rules to suit their own ends sometimes yeah and people would refer to that as being cultural you know this is this is what they are doing they're making up the rules as they go along and they do but they're doing it to align themselves to an honor system to ensure that traditions are maintained and arranged marriage is a tradition without a shadow of a doubt for somebody above the age of 16 that has the mental capacity to say yes or no. So where you have a person saying, okay, I respect the tradition of arranged marriage, but I don't want to get married. And then you have the pressure of parents saying, well, you're going to get married because we say so. This is an arranged marriage. That becomes forced. But what the family are doing is they're trying to maintain the tradition of an arranged marriage through force, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, so, and sometimes it seems like it's also about obedience. Like, um, yeah, people like to control people in a certain mm. situation. They don't like it when someone is almost rebelling against them and they feel like they're losing control. And, and some people can really sure. react to that. But the thing is, I'm a parent. I have three children, okay? And as a parent... My children have got rules, you know, I, I, I want their safety paramount to me, you know, I don't want them to be mixing with vulnerable, complex behaviours and whatever, so I parent them, but my parenting does not allow me to put them at risk, it does not allow me not for them not to embrace their independence and the rights that they have. This is not parenting, although your, the, these families that want their children to behave according to an honor system would call it, we're doing our best for our kids, that's what they would say. Um, you know, we, us finding you somebody to marry and you having to marry that person is in your interest, we're doing it in your interest. So it would be dressed up like that, which which is wrong in all honesty. And I always use Shafilia Ahmed's case because Shafilia, you know, she she was born in Bradford, moved to Warrington as a young kid. She, her ambition was to be a barrister, okay? As a parent, you know, she was a, an A-star student. She had over eight great GCSE grades. I would be proud of that kid if that kid was mine. They saw that as a cause of shame. You know, she lit up a room when she walked in it. She expressed herself. She had mates. She was popular. All that was received as dishonorable behavior. They, they couldn't handle that. So, uh, well, I don't her, understand that. So, how, how's the, um, having the A-levels, uh, uh, how's that embarrassing? Well, because well, they, they were her GCSEs and she only managed to go to college for a few weeks because she's got ideas above her station. She's thinking independently. She's got aspirations. Their plans were to get her married off, which they drugged her in this country, put her on a plane when she was 16 and a half and got her to Pakistan where they said, right, now you're getting married to deal with you. And having those ideas about your station, you know, wanting aspirations, um, being intelligent, wanting to be a barrister, going out with your mates, just integrating and all those things that we expect any normal teenage kid to do. So 
to prevent that, she really swallowed half a bottle of bleach. Mm. And then we came back to the UK. You know, she's on a, a A&E in, in one of our hospitals for eight weeks, and the professionals send her back home, and then subsequently she's murdered. The point I'm making is, is that any parent would be proud of to have a child like that. They saw that as a challenge because they believed that person was not adhering and upholding the, the honourable reputation of the family, so they wanted to deal with her. They tried it by marriage. She swallowed the bleach. That wasn't working. She is still persistent. I want to learn. I want to be a barrister. So in the end, they took her life. Oh, that's terrible. I mean, it reminds me a bit of that um, Malala situation. Uh, the girl mm. who was uh, sort of campaigning again, you know, for, to try and get girls to take p part in education and then ended up getting shot. Is, do you think yeah, there's some sure. correlation there? Yeah, it goes back to, you know, the the empowerment of women and, you know, we we are regarded as being subservient in some way within these communities. You know, the gender roles are not equal between men and women. You don't have a right to be educated. Your life is mapped out before you. You will be getting married off. My mother used to say to me, the only reason why I send you to school is because it's a law. If I had a choice, you wouldn't be because she was preparing daughter-in-laws for the future. So yeah, it goes back to that question. You know, we're not all equal. In fact, women are, you know, fundamentally given a very subservient position and also we have the power to dishonor our families through our behavior. So our families control our sexuality as women. That doesn't happen with men. That happens with women. Yeah, I mean... um as a result of, of some of this, have you at all felt yourself becoming a little bit anti-men or anti-religion either? No. Well, I, 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 when I left home, um, you know, I, I became an atheist because this religion did this to me and I was blaming the religion because if your family are saying it's religion, you have to do this, be a good Sikh, this is the religion, which I was being told, you know, I'm going to resent something that has oppressed me. And that's how I felt. So I was an atheist for a while. And then um, I didn't read a book until I was 27 years old in my life. I, I left school, no qualifications. And then I went on to university and I studied women in Sikhism. And I, I realized from the reading that it, Sikhism was built on a foundation of equality and compassion. It was, it was actually developed to abolish the caste system because the caste system, the gurus who but you preached about Sikhism and talked about how it, it made people unequal. You know, we can't have those divisions. We have to have equality. So all these messages I was getting from my own research actually were the opposite to what I had been taught at home, obviously, because if my mother thought for one minute I thought that about my religion, well, I'd be using it to empower myself, would I not? So I'd been too far gone by then, and, and I'm actually now a baptized Christian. Um, and I was baptized years ago. But the point is, I came to religion myself. I'm not anti-religion at all. In fact, the religions, from my perspective, and the religious leaders have a role to come out and stand up and be countered in saying forced marriage is not religion. religious. In fact, you know, we can use the religion to speak out against forced marriage and murders. And I don't hear them saying that suddenly. So, is, is there any men, know, men that come out and campaign uh, against this, yeah, uh, these topics? We, 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 we at Carmen Vana support men and women. So men are also affected by forced marriages and honour abuse as well. Their experiences in terms of how they're socialised is very different to girls, okay? Um, but nevertheless, they can be convicted of forced marriage and honour abuse. And I'm sure people reading this or hearing this will think, yeah, well, what about men? Men are victims, but they don't experience it in the same way as women do. We see a lot of gay men whose family will want to marry them off to hide their sexuality. So mm -hmm. these are these are Asian gay men, South Asian gay men whose family realise they're gay and so they want to get them married off very quickly because they don't want people to realise in the communities, you know, that they are gay. That that is a huge no no with respect to reputation. Right, right. Um, you've written um, a number of books, and um, mm -hmm. one of the one of the books was about your travels in India, I believe. Um, 
Yeah. How, how different do you think are the problems of, of women in India in, in relation to honour killings and um, forced marriages compared to the UK? Uh, well, I, I think the scale of the problem is, is far greater in India and um, the support is, is terrible. It really is. Um, in comparison to what we have here in the UK, what you don't have in India is you don't have government support. You have a legal system where women are, are raped and abused. They're queuing up to, you know, put their files in and they, their cases can take years. If women flee abuse, um, there's nowhere to house them. You know, so they stay in situations for that reason. It, it is horrendous in terms of the, the lack of regard and recognition that this is a real problem. It would be the same in Pakistan and in India. And you need government intervention, you need the police. At least we have a, a police force that takes on the role of police in this. And over there, some of the police officers are like-minded, same like-minded as the perpetrators. And we saw that with recent attacks in, um, in India, where police officers turned a blind eye to a woman being raped by men because of her behavior. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's really deeply ingrained in these things are allowed to happen because there it's overt, it's in your face and people aren't doing anything. Here it's covert, it's hidden. These these communities exist, the mindset exists here, but it's not overt. The self-policing in these communities is happening every single day. There are communities out there that know the next door neighbor has been forced into marriage from the same community, that know a girl has disappeared and they're not reporting it. Just to go back to, um, I just wanted to go back to the concept of love in mm. uh, these kind of uh, cultures. Does it exist? I mean, the the, the concept of love towards um, the sons and daughters, uh, attachment and bonding, or is it a mm. bit? Is it different? Because I just wanted to sort of get to the bottom of that. Yeah, well, of course it exists. Um... You know, there is a there is a presence of males to females, and that still exists, and we know that as well. You know, we had a debate in this country this year around the high proportion in South Asian communities of of abortive female fetuses to males that is happening in this country, which it still is. Um, but in terms of attachment, it does absolutely. Now, this doesn't exist in all communities, by the way, and I'm not pleased. I think I'm generalising. It's not just South Asian either. Also, we see these cases in Kurdish, Iranian, Somalian, African, even a small percentage of tribal communities. And dual heritage children can report if they live within families that operate on the system. But it's, it, there, are, there are like minded people out there who are decent human beings. We're not hearing them. Where the attachment gifts is where a, a, a child is born within a family that operates an honor system. I'm sure the love for a child is there, but it it has to be first and foremost the priority is given to this child being raised to ensure that they do not dishonor their family. So that person is almost conditioned to believe that you, if, if you love your parents less if you don't behave in a certain way, because some people will be using emotional blackmail as well. I mean. For me, love is unconditional when it comes to a child. You know, a child doesn't have to be born. It, it, every child is entitled to unconditional love and regard. Yes, we parent. We parent to protect them. In these cases, where you have an honest system and a child is born, the attachment and the love is very much about the conditions. We raise you, but we are raising you with the condition that you do not bring shame on this family. Therefore. You have to behave in a certain way, and you do that because you love your mother, and we love you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. The one, one thing I was going to say, though, is um, some of these killings seem so brutal. Like, is that, there's actual mm. hatred there. Like, you know, mm. I've heard of acid cut, uh, cutting faces, mutilation. Sure. Um, one, a father-in-law gouged a, a UK woman's eyes out um, because yeah, he, was, he yeah. felt that she was dishonoring the family. Sure. Why, why do you think that's yeah. the case? Why is, why is there that feeling, seem like the real real hatred there to intention to cause pain, not just not just make a point? You know? Well, the, 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 the hatred is about the dishonour. That's what the hatred is about. We saw it with Benaz Mahmoud, who was repeatedly raped by five people in the family, four people in the family, sorry, her father didn't rape her, multiple rape because they wanted to 
kill her dishonourable spirit. So, but really, you know, no, when it comes to things like that, I mean, surely they, they mu it must have been a, a more of a, a, a sort of partly a kick for them as well. They, you know, they're getting to have sex with someone. It's so it's, they, they could hardly feel like they're actually doing no. her a favour, don't they? No, no, no. The point I'm making, I mean, the whole thing is about it's wrong. But what I'm, what I'm talking about is where you have an honour crime, okay, our victim, and we would call her a victim or him a victim, the family doesn't see that person who dishonoured the family as a victim. That person is a perpetrator, mm. okay? So the family in these killings will see that person as somebody who needs to be punished and needs to be dealt with. Okay? Yeah. Depending on how dishonourable they thought it was, whatever they have done, will be the severity of the punishment. So Bernard Mahmoud, she was seen kissing a boy at a tube station. That was deemed so high up there in the stakes of dishonour that she did not only deserve to die, but she deserved to die a horrific death because of how dishonourable it was what she did. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. But, but that, I've heard of, I've heard of cases think, where someone's just looked looked at a boy and that's resulted sure, in, their, in their death, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the kind of cases like Esma and Nizia, you know, she, she graduated and she had ambition and she was, you know, family um, didn't like that, the fact that she also had a boyfriend. A girl called Oksana Nav who went to my school she was taken out of education in Derby because they suspected she had a boyfriend, which she did actually. They realised she did. So she was forced to marry. She came back to Britain, wanted this guy. She had two children. She's now seven months pregnant. Her mother suspects Charles is Karen is not her husband, so calls a family meeting mm. to discuss, right, this, this kid might not be yours, so you've got two choices, looks on her. You either abort that child at seven months or we're going to kill you. That was a choice they gave her. And in their mindset, it was a choice to be had, and she refused. The brother, the mother, sorry, sat on her legs, and the brother strangled her to death. And that was their perception. They perceived the child she was carrying was not her husband. There was no actual evidence that it, it wasn't her husband. So you can even be um, significantly harmed or murdered, even if the family don't have any evidence that you've caused dishonor. If they even think it, it would be enough to put you at risk. Does that make sense? Yeah. Why? 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 Um. Why wouldn't she have been able to escape? Um. In that situation. Well. Would, would she have been able to, or would she have just been under too much surveillance? Well, again, let's go back to it. If your family operates an honor system, they're watching you. Mm. Not just your family. The eyes and the ears of the community, the taxi drivers, the woman down the road at the corner shop, everybody is reporting back to that family. Surveillance is something that is very up there in terms of ensuring that that child in that family does not cause shame. So the power victim is very isolated because they have multiple people watching them. So they have multiple perpetrators. With regards to Roxana, I don't know, you know. Our job is to reduce the isolation of victims. Had she known about a helpline like Carmen Nirvana, we would have reached out to her. Well, would, there, be, would, there, been, um, would there have been part of her that would have thought that maybe her family w were bluffing, that, that they wouldn't do that to her? Uh, look, Sana was called to a family meeting. Her mum and her brother was there, so she was just going there as a matter of course. And, the, you know, you wouldn't not do that. Whether she thought she was going to be killed or not is another thing. Mm. Um, but that happened. You know, that was a real case. It was tried in uh, Nottingham Crown Court and, you know, in the end her mother pleaded guilty and uh, her mother had no remorse whatsoever. Yeah. Have you, um, have you yourself come under criticism for fighting uh, for these issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, criticism um, from... You know, when I go out and I speak at events, sometimes people from within those communities, the South Asian communities, stand up and tell me I have no honour, I've got no shame. So they overtly say it. And, you know, they, they're very clear about their views about me, rubbishing my community, or you can't have loved your family, you know, for running away and not speaking out. And I also get risks. I get hate mail. In the past, I've had threats to life. I've had a, a threat of a bomb being put under my car. I've had all those things, but is it enough 
to stop me from speaking because the impact of speaking out is enabling people to report and enabling more people like yourself to speak about this as well. I heard um, I was I was doing a bit of research on this topic and um, I came across Injitsia Singh. Have you heard of him? No. He's a Sikh journalist appointed to the House of Lords, and um, mm -hmm. he said uh, he was saying a few derogatory things about you. Basically, saying you're making a career out of this, this, and that. He said there's there's no honour code. This, he said it's it's all a big exaggeration and a misunderstanding of Sikh culture. Is his attitude mm -hmm. typical of the people that um, have uh, criticised you? Jitsu Singh, is that what you call him? Sorry for sorry if my pronunciation right. It was it sounded like uh, Injitsu Singh. A Sikh journalist. Oh, Indigit. Indigit. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <yeah. laughs> and he's a, he's a what, a journalist to the House of Lords? Yeah, journalist appointed to the House of Lords. Um, uh, uh, Sikh, okay. Sikh well, journalist. Well, the thing here is, is what, what journalists or people in that community need to recognise is that, you know, if we start being defensive about this or start denying it exists, then we've got a problem, okay? Mm. If you look at what's happening in Rotherham recently, okay, one of the things that came out of the Rotherham report were here are these white girls who were being abused significantly by Asian men, mm. right? Now, some of the responses with respect to these girls in terms of when they reported, in terms of professionals should have protected them, turned a blind eye because these were Asian men. What was that about? That was about oh, I don't want to cause a problem, I've been trained to be culturally sensitive, I don't want to be called a racist, I've got to be careful. It's about physical correctness as well. So that gave the perpetrators more power. Today, there are people out there who are not willing to talk openly and honestly about what that meant to those girls that were not protected because they're being defensive about, you're picking on Asian men here, it existed, it happened. Now, what we have to recognize is, in all communities, abuse can happen, okay? We have a significant problem within South Asian communities, the Islam, Sikhism, Hinduism, and Bangladesh communities of honor systems. I, if people want to call me, making a clear out of it, trust me, I have lost more in my life with respect to my family, sleep, Lots of other things. I have three children on their, their mother's side. It's a complete blank. In terms of the loss of I, I have personally experienced the sacrifices I have made. I stand by that with truth and integrity because I know these issues exist in these communities and the communities who want to silence people like me and others or make derogatory comments like Mr. Indigit thing are part of the problem. Well, so, yeah. you know, he can be introduced to, I suggest he comes to our help line and he listens to the 800 calls we receive a month and he listens to every victim caller who has an experience of honour abuse. Because, I wish he would, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the girl, Jagir Kaur, who I was on Five Live with last week, brave young woman who had her eyes gouged out by her father-in-law talking about this devout Sikh man who controlled every aspect of her life so she didn't cause shame on the family. How can you deny, even if it was one person, that it existed? So, you know, people like him can come forward and say that, but people like him also need to take a step back and look at the evidence and actually come face to face with victims and survivors who've been through this. Absolutely. I mean, I heard also that, you know, in the UK, there's sometimes kids disappearing from school and they're mm. sent off to marry someone. Absolutely. Is that, yeah. is it, are schools getting any better at noticing these no. summer holiday absences? I'm actually meeting the education minister tomorrow, September the 11th, to discuss this because they're not getting better, no. And the reason why I'm prompted to meet the education minister is because, this is Nikki Morgan, is because I have heard in the last few weeks Many teachers come to me saying, Jasvinda, we have reported in our school of girls being taken abroad in the summer holidays, and our school told us to keep our nose out of it. It was cultural. Mm. Jasvinda, do we, what do we do? These girls have gone now. Should we wait till September to see if they come back? 
can you take that risk? And these teachers are new teachers that have only been teaching a year that said this to me. So I just wrote to her and said, this is unacceptable. I was born here. I want to be afforded the same level of protection as my white counterpart. But I'm not. These kids are not. And it's the same thing. You know, they need to be culturally sensitive, not want to offend people, etc. And And that's what happened in Rotherham. That is what is happening all over the UK. And people have got to frame this for what it is, child and public protection. It's not part of culture to be abused. Cultural acceptance does not mean accepting the unacceptable. I think also, I mean, it could. It does seem like um, in the UK and probably in a lot of other countries as well that people in positions of power who have the power to change these things, they're not, to be honest, they're not always the nicest kind of people anyway. So they're, they're well, less, li- less likely to actually do anything about it. Well, well, the thing is, the one thing I'm not worried about is being popular, okay? Mm. I'm not worried about anybody's vote for me or whatever. I'm going to stand up and say what I think and speak out. I'm speaking people's truths here. I'm speaking the truths of people who are silent. You know, where you have positions of power, like the people you're talking about, mm. they have a duty to make sure these voices are he- heard. You know, the greater the power, the more dangerous the abuse can be because because it is dangerous not to speak out when you are in a position of power. You know, because they are actually, by not saying anything, part of the problem and allowing it to happen. They are colluding with it. So, you know, people in positions of power and even Mr. Indigit Singh in the House of Lords or whoever writes his laws, whatever, right? You know, he has the power to change things, and it's an abuse of power not to speak out. Do you think that there might also be a problem with communities in the UK are a bit detached from each other, like different cultures, like, you know, the Sikh community, the Muslim community, Asian communities, uh, different nationalities, that there's sometimes not enough an openness and mixing between different cultures? Like you you mentioned that... um, Sometimes you were told maybe not to mix with white people and that. Isn't that also part of the problem? Cultures aren't mixing enough, so people aren't sharing views and there's not enough yeah. openness. You know? well, well, yeah, the thing is, you, you're talking about integration as well. And um, with respect to honour systems and the girls that we deal with, part of the threat is integration. They're not allowed to integrate because mm. that is deemed as dishonourable. So they're kept away from integrating. You know, and I think that is part of the problem in terms of, you know, in schools as well and the segregation that goes on. I think Trevor Phillips talks about sleepwalking into segregation and communities, you know, living in particular areas with communities, not from other communities and not integrating them. And this fear generates as well. And then, you know, prejudice happens as well and people start thinking the worst of the communities. But with respect to... Um, this particular community where we see honor systems and forced marriages, there is a deliberate attempt to ensure integration doesn't happen. Mm. And that is a problem. If, if say, like um, someone from a different school started speaking to, a, uh, say, a Sikh family and started asking questions, mm. c- could that person then turn around saying, you're, you know, try and get that that person into trouble when saying they're being racist, you know, that it might, it might happen in this day and age? Well, I think, you know, talking and in, talking to a family, you know, you know, and integrating is are two different things, actually, because stepping into their, their community and their world, and you have to look at places like, you know, Bradford, whereby you've got kids in a school, all from one community, that will probably never meet somebody from another community, ever. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's not right, really, schools. is it? No, well, you're talking about, you know, 99.9% of the kids are South Asian, and then they're going back into a South Asian community living in Britain, they're never going to meet somebody from another community in their life. Yeah. You know, and vice versa as well, where, you know, you've got a few non-Asian kids, but the majority are from that community. But that isn't really integration, is it? No, it's not at all. And and that will affect the makeup of Britain, the beliefs, the value systems, and all the other things as well. It almost feels like a them and us scenario, to be quite honest with you. 
and and it shouldn't be because that is really going to create tensions and you know break society down and people are not going to recognize the the value of communities and the value of integration as well and it also will create fears yeah, I mean, th there was a new law that was passed recently in the UK. Um, is, do you think that is sure. going to help the situation regarding forced marriages? Well, I've been a huge campaigner for the law. Many people know that. I've been advocating for the law for 10 years. And David Cameron himself said his head was turned on the issue of the result of Carmen Navarro's campaign. Um, absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, we know this is happening within communities. Whether we want to be defensive about it, deny it, you know, the facts are the facts. It is a significant problem, and it's a British problem. So if those communities are not willing to take this on board and challenge this, well, then we have a role to send out a very strong message. And that's what governments have done in creating the law. They've said, this is against the law in Britain, and if you are doing this, you are breaking the law, and you will be sentenced to up to seven years, because we are not accepting child marriage or forced marriage. So by sending out that strong message, I hope it acts as a deterrent. One of the things it's already done, I can tell you, is it's increased reporting to our helpline because there's been a shift in how people think about forced marriage from a professional perspective. It's no longer something that is cultural and what they do. Actually, it's against the law. That's helped. And reporting. do you think um, the law will provide protect protection for any anyone who's obviously in a dangerous situation? Yeah, because... Victims can now own this as a crime, and the law has a duty to protect. Today, my team, Carm Navarra team, are at Leicestershire Police Force, training over 30 specialist police officers in forced marriage on a base violence. That's one of nine police forces. We want to train all 43 police forces. Protection will only happen if officers are aware of the law, and also they're trained to be able to support victims. I believe most people who sign up into policing or teaching, sign up to teach police and to protect as well. But equally, we've got to make them aware of what the law looks like, what it means in terms of protection. Does that make sense? Yeah, because yeah. Because the, the training side of it is going to be really important. But there's a real willingness now, since the change in the law, to engage on the issue. And that is really significant for us because it's taken us years to get there. Um, what would you say to any um, any woman who might be listening to this podcast who's in an in abusive relationship in, 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 in any kind of culture or religion or is in a controlling family, a forced marriage situation mm. of any kind? What should they do first of all and who can they go to ask for protection? Well, I would say to any man or a woman who is experiencing this, first and foremost, you're not alone. You're one of many thousands of people experiencing abuse at the hands of the people who are meant to love them the most, their family. The worst thing you can do is keep it to yourself. You need to speak to somebody. I recognize there is a fear attached to speaking. I was taught to be silent. I understood that to talk to anybody outside your family means you are shaming your family. What I would advise you to do is pick up a phone, speak to somebody you trust. Call the helpline. Can I give the helpline number? Yeah, of course, yeah. Our helpline number is 0800 599 You don't have to give us your name. You can be a number. The people at the end of the phone are trained to respond to you, uh, experience an honor, abuse, or forced marriage. We never speak to your family. We won't talk to professionals unless you want us to speak to professionals. The point I'm making is it's confidential. If, so it's, um, if it happens to be someone from abroad, can they still get through to that yeah. number? Yeah, I mean, if somebody is at risk and um, they've been taken abroad, really we can we can help you absolutely. The force marriage unit, we have a force marriage unit based in London, it's a government unit, and they rescue people, British subjects, from um, predominantly India and Pakistan every year who've been taken abroad and forced to marry. So you have a specific unit to help you if you're at risk abroad now or, or you're worried about being taken abroad, you know, don't think because you're abroad there isn't help available to bring you back home. There is. You don't need to worry about not having a passport because they can get you an emergency passport. You don't even have to worry about flights because they will sort your flights out. The point I'm making is 
there's lots of help available. But you've got to pick up a phone or if there's a mate listening to this who thinks it's happening to their friend, you pick up the phone and get some information for your mate. The worst thing you can do is believe what your family are telling you and that is you're shaming them by behaving like this or there's no help available for you because nobody is going to believe you. We believe you, but you need to break the silence. Yeah, absolutely. Um if for some reason you can't get to a phone, so there's a voicemail thing on, on my site, so you can always leave a message there and I'll pass it on to Jasvinder as well. Um, and there's a website as well that you can go on. Yeah, what's and, the website? You know, have, a read, have a read around on the website because you've got the stories of other people on there as well, lots of info. It's www.karmanirvana.org.uk www.karmanirvana.org.uk dot org dot uk how do you spell nirvana is that the, the normal N spell? yeah it's k-a-r-m-a-n-i-r-v-a-n-a -A -A. okay excellent excellent um jasvinda whether your family appreciate what you're doing or not it's clear you're doing an awful lot to to help people in these situations and any parent will be will be proud of your achievements what what do you hope to achieve in the future um well one of my greatest achievements is always going to be that Karma Van has made a dent in the reporting and put this issue on the national agenda. That, that's huge. I have um, three great children. That's huge. Um, and a grandson, by the way. Um, and uh, for me, I, I will keep campaigning. I will, will keep on campaigning, keep on speaking out. I'm not complacent. There's still a lot to do. We've got a long way to go yet. You know, I want to get us to a place where when anybody hears the word forced marriage or on a basis, they know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, every police force to have a forced marriage unit. You know, the, the law, we've got a new law, it's got to be implemented. So I see myself still campaigning, um, still out there speaking out against injustice, who knows, writing another book, um, at campaigning. In my blood. It's not going to go anywhere now. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. Um, <laughs> thanks ever so much for coming and talking to us today. Um, You're welcome. Really appreciate it, and uh, I hope people listening will take some of these points to heart. And especially if there's any people working at schools, uh, you know, if you notice yeah. people going missing over the summer, that's that's the period sure. of time when it tends to happen, isn't it? Yeah, and there will be there will be teachers out there who know some kids have not come back. There's something we can do about that, but we need to know that you're worried. If they need advice, they can contact you as well, right? Absolutely, yeah. 42% of the callers to the helpline are professional callers. So we want you to pick up the phone. And you know, we want to hear your ignorances. You know, you can never offend us at all. Part of the problem is we fear offending people, so we don't ask the question. You can't do that with Calm Nirvana. Ask us whatever you want, because that's the point of learning. So pick up the phone, and we'll work through it to safeguard the person, which is the most important thing. Can I just say um, thank you, Truth Sentinel, for doing this because it's people like you that help us reach other people. It's really important that you took the time to tweet me to say, Jazz, would you do this? Because getting the word out is everybody's responsibility, not just our charity, other charities. It's people like yourselves who may not be affected by these issues but are bothered enough to speak out against it. So people out there, please listen to this, tweet, social network, and get other platforms for us to speak on as well. Thanks, Jez Vinder. No, it's my pleasure. Um, thank you very, very much for coming. Hope to speak to you again at some point in the future and, and tell us uh, maybe, hopefully, the progress that's that's been made at some point in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, take it easy. Bye. All right. Bye. So quite a serious topic there, and one that I'm glad we can try and get involved with. I think if we're unhappy with the way this planet is being run, then... It's quite satisfying if we can actually try and do something about the things we're not happy with. We may not agree on all the things that are wrong, um, and may not agree with each other on everything, but we can all agree that surely that this world could be a whole lot better than it is. And I think people have actually f forgotten how good it could be, and just come to accept the way things are. I think there will be a revolution of some type. Um, it may, may be a revolution in the way people think, and for large groups of the population to all stand up and say enough but something has to happen because 
um, you know, there's a lot of people who don't realize how bad it is. If you start investigating how corrupt our, our governments are and how many of our freedoms have ta been taken away and how people think they're free, but actually all the land around you is owned by other people and there's no real reason why that has to happen. Of course there can be some some uh, loose structure to our society, but it's it's got ridiculous and I think we've all grown up um, into this world thinking it's normal, but if you sit down and think about it, it could be 100% better. Um, and if you think that everything's okay then you're really not looking hard enough at what's going on that's all i can say okay so we we have uh, debate shows from time to time um, or at least parts of our shows will be debates on various topics it might be stuff that we've spoken about for example we've spoken about positive thinking before um i mentioned that with um, we talked about that with rosemary ellen gooley uh, and today we're going to have part one of a debate about positive thinking uh, and the positive thinking movement and whether positive thinking um, actually does help create a better future for yourself and for people around you. You know, we're going to be talking about manifestation um, and, you know, positive thinking and uh, basically um, at the end of it, if you have the chance, go to the chat room make your comments known there, make comments under the video. Uh, there's a vote, uh, there's a link to a vote on whether you think positive thinking does help. You can vote yes or no on that. Um, you know, um, so I'm, we're going to go over to Anthony, our academic researcher from the university, previously from the University of Vilkent, uh, now conducting further research in the AGU State University in Kayseri, east of Cappadocia, in the shadow of the Urges volcano. Yeah, I do have to write that down because um, I, haven't, I can't say it off by heart at the moment. Uh, we're going to talk about ISIS and then have a debate about positive thinking. So, hello, Anthony. Hi, how are you? Very good, thanks. Welcome back to Truth Sentinel. It's been such a long time since we spoke to you last. It has, it has. I've been, uh, well, off adventuring. Where have you been? I've uh, been to a lot of places. Uh, uh, I spent a long time in Bulgaria, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, and I've relocated within Turkey. Okay, good. So mm. you must have, um, we, uh, presumably this was all research for Truth Sentinel, yeah? <laughs> Every moment of it. <laughs> good, good, good. That's what we like to hear. And what kind of things have uh, been on your radar in the last sort of couple of weeks? last couple of weeks um it has seemed to me that the world has finally gone nuts mm. uh i mean it's been a long time coming we've been teetering on the brink of it for some time but i think now we really have we really have you know passed a threshold don't you think there, have, there has been some crazy things going on i mean over in the uk as well um i've obviously been working hard myself so i've, I've heard some of it but um you know, about ISIS and that kind of thing. What, what sort of things were you thinking of? Well, I mean, ISIS, ISIS definitely. Um, I don't even know where to begin with those guys, but I, I was interested to uh, read their, um, their manifesto uh, because, okay, this is not, um, this is not uh, I suppose, the main point we should be, should be discussing about ISIS, but it was a very interesting detail. Um, part of their ideology as outlined by the group is a rejection of something called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. What's um, that? Yeah, I, not a widely known uh, um, piece of paper, but it was an agreement uh, signed during World War One by Britain and France and with the cooperation of Russia about how the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire would be divided up after World War One. In other words, the Ottomans had most of the Arabian Peninsula, but the Ottomans were going down. That that became the longer World War One went on, the more that became one of the war aims to make sure there was no Ottoman Empire afterwards. So then uh, there were various discussions about what would happen, uh, how much autonomy Arabs would be allowed to have, um, versus how much they would become, you know, like part of a redrawn European colonial map. And there was a secret agreement uh, which was which involved senior politicians in Britain and France and Russia and uh, was signed in 1916, um, which talked about a carve-up. 
So all of all of uh, the Arabian Peninsula would be owned uh, by by European powers. Um, that became a huge embarrassment uh, in 1917 after the Russian Revolution because the Bolsheviks, um, having access to to the documents uh, associated with all of these meetings where the carve up of Arabia took place, the Bolsheviks outed the British and the French. They published these papers and. It was, uh, you know, to the, much to the embarrassment of the British and the outrage of the Arabs. But according to, uh, according to ISIS and others like them, this was the first plan on which many others were were modelled, and that effectively, although the British and French were outed and and had to take a step back public publicly from the plan, it went ahead anyway, and that is. Um, part of the reason why the Islamic world is so fragmented, so many people are turning away from the essentials of Islam, uh, the countries have become so poor, ruled by dictators, blah, blah, blah. There, there is a sense among ISIS and other groups that, that the, these agreements, uh, to some extent, determined the course of 20th century history in that part of the world in a negative way. So. What's interesting about that, I think, is that, uh, is that history is really hanging heavy uh, in recent times over, over the Middle East. I mean, it always has to an extent, but um, in recent times in particular, there are these historical episodes which, which really, um, really ruffle the feathers of, of, of people in the Middle East because they feel that things that happened during the 20th century, which, let's face it, was a century of more or less unbroken horror, but uh, things that happened in the 20th century have had disastrous consequences, which now they need to, to set right in some way. I'm not sure I like the way they're trying to go about setting it right, though. I absolutely do not like the way, <laughs> the way they're doing that, and I, and I don't think most Muslims do either. It's, it's, it's terrifying. But I, I think it's... Um, it's illustrative of something that we need to be careful of. You know, I mean, as I said, 20th century, century of horrors, and certain things happened in the 20th century which provoked a response of never again. You know, I think I think we talked about this once before. After 1945, when when uh, the the doings of the Nazi Party um, and the, the concentration camps became public knowledge, there was this. Uh, there were international symposia on it and all kinds of stuff, and this never again movement arose uh, because it was agreed that uh, genocide was just not on. Of course, that hasn't stopped it from occurring, <laughs> um, but it, it's something which is, I think, high in the, in, the, in the public awareness now, is that this is something that you just don't do. And I think that uh, one lesson that we can learn from uh, a lot of recent events, in fact, especially events in Iraq, is engineering countries, drawing up countries on paper uh, does not work and should be avoided if we want the 21st century to be any less of a horror than the previous one. Well, it certainly doesn't look as though it's going that way, does it? I mean, uh, it looks like it's, I mean, according to um, our Prime Minister Cameron, uh, we, we should prepare ourselves for decades of uh, fighting ISIS now. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that I mean, look, <laughs> that, that, in a sense, is a, is, a, is a crazy thing to say. The only person who would say that is a person who has decided that they are going to get on board with the American military industrial agenda. Um, because, as we all know, if, the American, if uh, America cuts its military spending, large parts of its industry fall over immediately, and it now doesn't have the depth and breadth economically to survive that collapse. So the Americans are... Are, are trapped. They've they've trapped themselves in a cycle of war. And the only person who would say ISIS is going to be the enemy for 30 years, for decades, is 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 a person who is trying to perpetuate that idea. Because the 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 most uh, the most generous estimates, I suppose you could say, are that ISIS has about 30,000 members. So if it's going to take us, if it's going to take us, you know, three or four decades to defeat an organisation of 30,000. Well, that's, you know, you can fit more people than that in a stadium. Well, so. this is why I believe we're being lied to constantly. I mean, I, I think uh, after, after this beheading video surfaced, um, which looked very professionally made, and a lot of people suggesting that the West has got something to do with that in some ways, uh -huh. um, 
After this, uh, Cameron, our Prime Minister, announced that there's going to be all kinds of new laws coming in. And uh, I listened to Prime Minister's questions and um, it was really quite scary what he said. Basically, he said that new laws are going to be introduced and it's not just going to cover terrorists. It's going to cover anyone who um, has a negative effect on the cohesion of society. And I just thought, holy cow, we've got we've got some... Uh, terrifying laws coming in that are going to take away people's rights basically because anytime they bring in a law that um, is supposed to combat terrorism they have to make it politically correct so it has to cover all cultures and so what that so basically it means anyone with any extreme views and now obviously that's that can be interpreted in many different ways but I have a feeling the extreme views are going to be people who don't agree with uh, the the um, conventional way of thinking which is anyone who disagrees with the government basically well let's hope that the uh, the legal profession and the advocacy portion of the legal profession gets gets hold of that legislation with both hands and uses it to convict and imprison uh, large parts of the government of the country who passes that legislation because that's the only uh, in, in it, it may sound bizarre to say this but uh, but this is, a, I've noticed, an, emer an emerging trend is that there are certain, you know, lawyers and especially advocacy lawyers who examine uh, legislation very carefully to try to make politicians more accountable. And it would be a wonderful irony. Uh, and, uh, yeah, especially making them more, more accountable internationally for things that they've done, which, which their own country's laws don't, don't hold them accountable for. Uh, but I, think, I think that's true. There are, but that's a very, very small amount of lawyers that are doing that. Yeah, but it would be wonderful to see that turned around on on the parliament, wouldn't it? Well, you've you've clearly uh, compromised the cohesion of society here, guys. Sorry about that. Ten years for you. <laughs> well, we could easily do that over here. We've got a child abuse scandal going on in the UK at the moment, which they're desperately trying to cover up. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people in alternative media know what's going on, and it's be that it's basically gone very quiet. But uh, I mean, it was hilarious the other day in the same uh, prime minister's questions that I listened to. They were talking about getting um, the UK Parliament ministers to investigate another child abuse scandal that's going on outside of Parliament. Mm -hmm. it, it's hilarious because, no, we, uh, we need to investigate the ministers inside of Parliament, not get them to investigate child abuse outside of Parliament. Um, I mean, I, I, apparently, according to people who've been doing research over the last sort of few decades... The, the kind of people who are involved in child abuse in the UK uh, in Parliament go right to the top. Mm -hmm. uh, cabinet Minister, it could bring down the entire government if it's if they don't cover it up, but they're desperately trying to trying to do it, and it involves people who are currently ministers in the government. Yeah, of course, it, it would have a catastrophic effect on the government, which of course is why it will never happen. Nor will my, nor will my um, advocacy lawyers save the day, unfortunately. But it's nice to dream. Anything, <laughs> anything else that uh, cropped up on your radar? Yeah, like I said, the world has gone mad. You know, I mean, I mean, peace talks have started in, I believe it's in Wales. Yeah, the, the peace talks uh, uh, regarding the the Ukraine conflict. Uh, and, you might be right. Yeah, and and. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, this is this is just nuts. We're now having peace talks between Russia and Ukraine, while Russia is still denying that it's involved in the conflict. I so know. they're saying it's yes. It's a bit bizarre, like that. I don't know. I don't know why they're carrying on going down that that line. It makes them actually look a bit stupid. Yeah, we are. We we are, we're not fighting, but we will negotiate for peace. What the hell? But this is. This is, uh, you know, as has been pointed out a lot, um, this is a logical consequence of, of, you know, Putin's classic strategy of, you know, invasion by increments. You, it's uh, one commentator mentioned that he's treated the West like, you know, the frog in the pot. You know, you throw a, a frog into a pot of boiling water, he jumps out, but you put him in cold water and heat it up slightly. By the time he realizes, he's cooked. And this is how Putin goes about invading a country, as we've seen with Georgia and Ukraine. And we could well see, uh, in other cases as well, Transnistria and even possibly uh, parts of the Baltics, frighteningly enough. But this is what he's done. He's got to, he's got to the point now where he can have uh, a peace. Uh, he can he can have peace talks you now for a conflict which he's officially not even involved in. I, I wonder whether part of the reason he's doing that is to sort of say, well, uh, you're you're lying to us, so we're going to lie to you. It's just kind of like because. You know, basically, 
uh, Russia doesn't want Ukraine falling to becoming part of NATO and um, I think the West have been saying a lot of lies and so he's sort of saying okay well we're not in Ukraine then we're not fight we're not fight it's, it's kind of like um, being he's being sarcastic maybe I think he would be well within his bounds to do that because yeah I mean why why at this time would anyone from NATO uh, or indeed Poroshenko um, bring up the the topic of Ukraine and NATO I mean wh why that is just that's just they're, they're deliberately um, provoking him and uh, this is why I, I I just feel a bit of despair and and, and kind of really uh, think that you know these people are playing with all of our lives I mean this could could potentially result in World War three it's not that it's not a such a crazy thing to happen basically the route they're going down provoking a big country like Russia yeah I mean and and you know meanwhile the the EU who have been who have been staggeringly stunningly ineffective throughout this crisis um, much to the chagrin of, of, of people on the other, on you know on other in other peripheral regions of Europe, uh, they've suddenly said, "Oh yeah, we're, we've got a whole bunch of new sanctions to level against Russia." That's this week while the peace talks were in preparation. Yeah, and, so, um, and Putin's, clear, there's, Putin's there's, response was to say, just to remind everyone that they had nuclear weapons. Yeah, yeah. So this clearly, I mean, I, I don't know, it, it, it just, like I said, the world's gone insane. I mean, it, this is just stirring the pot, you know. Uh, I mean, the, the conflict in Ukraine's killed, what, almost 3,000 people? We need it to stop, regardless of who's got the bigger dick. Like, it just doesn't matter, you know, we need it to stop. So, um... Yeah, and meanwhile, uh, in the South China Sea a few days ago, uh, a Chinese military plane uh, intercepted a US military plane. Intercepted rather badly, it seems, because they, they came within 10 meters of each other. It started out as a, as a military interception, which is quite scary, and ended up as a near miss. They came within, this is, remember, fighter planes, you know, ultrasonic, supersonic, sorry, fighter planes, uh, came within 10 meters of each other in the South China Sea. It's crazy, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's come to light since then that this is the fourth similar incident of the year when Chinese military aircraft have intercepted U.S. military aircraft. The U.S. government is saying that they think these are rogue pilots. This was not an official directive, but I... I don't know whether that's what they really believe or whether that's what they're saying at this stage because they don't want to spark a crisis because they've got so much other stuff to deal with right now. I but think anyway. there's all kind I think it sounds to me like Asia are kind of prodding America to remind them that they're now becoming a superpower themselves. Mm -hmm. I noticed that uh, Putin went um, and met with the uh, Mongolian uh, prime minister uh, or president um the other day it sounds to me like this is why I believe that they're all planning World War three and, and and they're all in on it and it's going to go ahead because of the economic reasons you mentioned that everyone wants to make a lot of money well yeah and meanwhile um, I mean you know things are still it's still increasingly crazy in Turkey as well so Erdogan has now uh, he's now no longer the Prime Minister he's now the president uh, and he has appointed a kind of weaselly looking little man called uh, Dabatolo as his new prime minister. Um, Dabatolo was, was previously the foreign minister, and since his appointment, um, some very interesting things have emerged about this guy and why he should be such a close uh, cohort of, of someone like Erdogan. This guy is uh, what's known as a pan-Islamist. Uh, so, in other words, he he has over the last ten years uh, worked on getting Turkey's finger on the pulse of everything that happens in the Middle East, building trade links, political links, and so on. And it seemed to be a project of of, uh, of integration and closer ties and and, and you know economically uh, sound and so on. But he he has. Uh, he has said a few things that, that have worried some people. I've got a quote from him here. Not a leaf will stir in the Middle East without Ankara 
learning of it and responding. That's one of his quotes. But uh, he's also um, conducted research and published papers on this idea of pan-Islamism, which is a little bit similar to ISIS's philosophy of let's have one big Islamic megastate. He, David Tolo doesn't necessarily advocate removing all borders and making it one big caliphate, but, but he's talking about an Islamic bloc. And this is causing great concern at the moment and and well it should be <laughs> um, because we don't know what what that block would look like maybe it would be fantastic we don't know um, well I also um, heard that uh, the head of al-qaeda um, mm -hmm. is talking about forming their uh, their Islamic state in South Asia now so it's gonna uh -huh. we're gonna have we're gonna have them all over the place um, and if they're violent then it's just instead of um, one particular enemy it's just going to be um, spread out even more now so this war on terror is just going to be a joke because it's going to last forever basically because it's it's going to be impossible ever to say that the war is over is it there's mm. just going to be too many people involved and this and this is something which um which unfortunately relates uh to to the history of, of islam um Generally, when at, at periods in its history, when the, when uh, things have been more or less going well, you know, there's been either peace or uh, Islam has been in the ascendancy. It's it's been a very open religion. You know, there's a classic uh, image of, um, for example, if you think about Judaism, one of the classic uh, images is of rabbis sitting around debating the significance of the Torah. Yeah, and and Judaism has this tradition of it's a it's a living. Uh, moral philosophy of of let's let's take our scriptures and and uh, other things that we've learned along the way and and debate how be, you know how to live the best possible life right islam has been the same for large uh parts of its history but at times when it's been threatened uh it it tightens up and that that kind of openness and spirit of kind of experimentation and debate disappears and you get a very dogmatic version of Islam appearing in its place and unfortunately that that has happened uh, increasingly in this kind of post-colonial era and and the, the you know it, hap it happened originally in little pockets and then you had you know the Iranian revolution and other things like this and now it, there are parts of the Islamic world large parts of the Islamic world where it's not considered to be a dialogue you know between God and his people and 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 you know all trying to work it out together it's become a dogma in many places uh, and 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 that's why you get these people saying let's reestablish the caliphate because the caliphate um, it, that that uh, relates to the first four leaders of uh, Mecca and Medina, the original Islamic state in inverted commas, were two cities, Mecca and Medina, and uh, Muhammad ruled those two cities. He was a, their political leader and kind of regent. And then after he died, there were four successive people who ruled after him, called the caliphs, and those are considered, at least by Sunnis, uh, to have been extremely wise rulers that oversaw like a cultural flourishing and, and, and you know, people becoming more pious and society becoming a lot fairer and so on and so on and so on. And when they talk about, you know, like establishing the Islamic State and the Caliphate and all that sort of stuff, they're saying, let's go back to that period. So they're denying the thousand years or so of development of Islam in particular, and the world in general, that have come since then, which is, a, you know, an ultra-conservative dogmatic viewpoint. Indeed, indeed. It, it just, uh, it doesn't look good, that's all I know at the moment. Um, yeah. Talking of debates, we, we've got to have our debate, uh, which we're going to have on positive thinking soon. But before we do, um, I, I do remember you were going to talk, uh, say something about uh, India and a dog. Can you <laughs> yeah, yeah, explain yeah. a bit more about that story? Final proof of the world going mad. Uh, a couple of days ago, I believe it was yesterday or the day before. Um, let me find this. Yes, it was. It was yesterday, in fact. Um, so uh, a teenage, an Indian girl, um, 18 years old, has married a stray dog. <laughs> uh, she lives in a in a village in um, in the eastern part of India in a state called uh, Jark, Jark, Jarkhand. Sorry, um, and there was an elaborate village wedding, uh, and this girl married this dog who's been specially decked out for the occasion 
with lots of Hindu you markets so, and stuff. You? you would hope so, yeah. I mean, yeah. Maybe this effort. is rather, ra- rather bewildered-looking dog, <laughs> I might add. Maybe even reluctant. <laughs> Maybe even. I mean, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, I, I imagine Indian wedding feasts would be it'd be pretty lavish, and there'd be plenty for for a dog to mm. to enjoy. But. Uh, yeah, so she's married a dog because it's going to rid her of some demons so that eventually she can find her Prince Charming. That's what she said. Very odd. Very odd. But I have heard of people marrying animals before. I, I watched a, a very interesting documentary once. Um, it was quite disturbing as well. But, <laughs> but um, there was a guy who actually changed the front of his house so the, a horse could actually come inside uh, his house because he'd married a horse. Um, anyway, mm. yes. The, the thing about these kind of things, though, is though they're although they're absolutely nuts, at least they're harmless. You know, I I, I wouldn't mind if uh, if people wanted to set up a state and start marrying animals. I'd be like, fine, go ahead. You know, at least I don't have to go there on holiday. You know, I can just stay go go somewhere else. And and these people aren't going to try and kill me. But you know, that is true. Yeah. <clears throat> that is true. And and to, to be fair, uh, <laughs> yes, it is harmless. But and 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 to be fair. Uh, there are no divorce proceedings, so you know if the dog's not happy, uh, if if the dog becomes the victim of, uh, you know, passive aggressive. <laughs> That's one violence. thing you can say about animals is that, that you know they don't they don't seem to be uh, the most. Well, I suppose there are some aggressive animals around, but if we think about domestic animals, um, they don't do anyone any harm, do they? They're just uh, they're fairly passive creatures and you know you can you can actually treat them badly i think you can learn a lot from animals you can treat them badly and they're still going to come come back and just uh, treat you the same way you know they're very forgiving creatures yeah yeah and certainly and not only that but he's he's going to chase the demons away so apparently they do that as well okay well talking of chasing demons away or chasing maybe negative thoughts away uh, we're going to talk about positive thinking, and um, you're actually going to try and rebuff the idea that positive thinking is a good thing. Um, so we're going to have a little mini debate on that, and um, I'm going to put a little voting button at the end of the show, which I'll talk about uh, later, and give people the link so they can vote on whether they th- what they think about positive thinking. If you were to come make up a title for this discussion, this little debate, what would you say it's about? Is it about um, positive uh, is does positive thinking work or would you think of another title no i would call it the positive thinking scam that's a good title so let, let's um let's start with that the positive thinking scam i'll, I'll let you start off with and i'm going to try and maybe rebuff some of the things you're saying sure so i think we need to uh distinguish between three kind of related but but distinct things yeah there's um just a, a character trait of of being optimistic, yeah. then there's uh, then there's times when when people uh, say things like think positively, yeah. uh, suggesting that you should be more optimistic in a particular situation, yeah. and then there's another thing which is the the positive thinking movement. And now this is an ideology; it's not about character traits. It's an ideology which suggests that uh, the world is shaped by our wants and desires and thoughts so that by by focusing on the good things the bad things just cease to exist or at least they they leave you alone and go elsewhere as if you've created a kind of immunity for yourself so in this uh in this ideology thinking about good things leads to success and happiness and failing to think about good things leads to failure and unhappiness which is your fault because you've failed to change your your thought patterns Okay. Um, um, can mm-hmm. I can I just say a little thing, a little bit here? Of course, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, everyone does have their own idea of what positive thinking is. Um, I mean, I've heard of this movement as well. I think um, you've got you've got the, the books like and uh, the Biggest Secret. I think which is mm-hmm. which is sort of going down that idea of you create the world around you and you should think positive. But one thing I haven't heard is people saying it's your fault. That sound, that in some ways that sounds like uh, something quite negative to me. Like I, I've never, I haven't heard many people saying if you, if you're not successful, it's your fault. Because that would be, to me, that would go against. Uh, if someone was uh, did have a positive thinking movement, then actually point to someone and say it's your fault that you haven't become successful. There must, mm-hmm. there can't be that many people who actually do that in the positive thinking movement. Well, let's put it this way. Um, we we uh we can think of i think everybody can can think of times in their life where they they um they feel depressed or they're sad about something 
um, and and another person tells them to you know think positive, and it isn't isn't all that bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. there the, either that's because you're just sad about something, and the other is that you're clinically depressed. Yeah, you know? um, they're they're very different, uh, of course. So so let's talk about depression first. Okay, so so a lot of people come to this positive thinking movement because they they just want to fulfill more goals in their life or something like this yeah but but some people try it as a way of dealing with depression mm -hmm. and and I would say that if you're depressed positive thinking is not the place to go um, because the advice you get is really inadequate and, and and potentially damaging I would say so for example um, medical research uh, has has shown I think beyond any doubt that uh, depression is a legitimate medical problem. Yeah, you know various kinds of uh, depression have been have been defined, and there's one manic depression which goes in cycles. So you have short periods of being intensely depressed and short periods of being intensely positive and ambitious. When you start all kinds of projects and then you get depressed and you can't finish any of them, you look around you at the at the, you know, the mess in your garage or whatever, and you think, "Oh my God, I'm a total fucking failure." Um, isn't um, isn't being bipolar linked to that as well? It is. Yeah, yeah. It's it's there's there's definite kind of crossover in those conditions. But look, it, the, one of the characteristics of of being of of, de of depression um, is that people lose their usual ability to see their difficulties in perspective. Yeah. Um, so whatever problems you have, they begin to seem, you know, in, insurmountable. Um, you can, of course, say that most people's problems do pale in comparison to, you know, losing your leg or, or I don't know, um, Russian insurgents invading your town <laughs> uh, or finding out you've got terminal cancer. You know, most people's problems are a lot smaller than that. So you, you can legitimately say to these people, look, it's not that bad and everything will work out and so on. And, and probably there's a good chance you're right. Yeah. But, but that's part of the disease of depression, that, that you, you can no longer do that. So, so when these people come to the, to the positive thinking movement uh, and they're all about thinking positive thoughts and, and changing your thought patterns and so on, basically what the positive thinking people are saying to the depressed people is, you know that disease you've got? Try not to have it. No. Yeah, no, I, 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 can totally, I can totally understand that. Um, mm. I think someone with medical depression, it's going to, I still think that, that thinking positively is not going to, you know, or, or going down a route of starting to change their mentality uh, yeah. is a good is a good route to go down. To, so to start thinking positive, but no, I don't think anyone, well, I, I don't think it'd be wise for anyone to say, yeah, you just need to do this. It's that simple. It's not going to be that simple for someone with depression. That's going to no, take. It's, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot more time. But I still think changing the mindset of that person is a route to go down for sure. But I think, I mean, unfortunately, these these positive thinking people just just have no understanding of that, and also uh, they're in it for the money. So they're going to accept. They're not going to make that that like we could call it, I suppose, an ethical distinction. They're not going to make that distinction. Um, and another problem there is that um, if you're feeling depressed, yeah, which usually involves feelings of inadequacy and failure and so on, then you surround yourself with people telling you how they've changed their lives by thinking positively and it doesn't work for you, then you've just got one more reason to see yourself as a failure. And in fact, the mind of a depressed person uh, is in some ways on a mission to destroy that person's self-worth. This disease, when you're uh, in the grip of it, I suppose you could say, one thing that happens is you, you take whatever input is around you in the environment and you try to interpret that in a way that tells you that you're crap. Yeah. So the worst thing to do is to surround yourself with, with you know, people who are telling you how successful and, and happy I, they are. I think I would agree with you, with you that someone with uh, long-lasting clinical depression, positive thinking alone is not going to be the only answer. I think there's going to be lots of other issues that their, their doctor will talk to them about. But yeah, yeah for sure it's not. But, I, but I, I would say that the positive thinking movement and I'm only I'm just using that label to encompass everything to do with positive thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that it's not particularly aimed at manic depressives. It's aimed at everybody. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about people who um, just feel a bit sad. Uh, perhaps they're just you know down about things generally, or 
or something specific has happened in their life, you know, uh, um, they're grieving or... Or, or maybe they feel a bit unfulfilled with their lives. Yeah. Um, that's a perfectly normal part of life. And in fact, I would argue that it's necessary to, to our overall well-being, that, that when bad shit happens, we allow ourselves to react emotionally you know, in inappropriate ways. And if we don't, I would think it, it tends to make us quite fucked up <laughs> and, and tends to make us a bit robotic. You know? but, the, but the positive thinking movement completely disagrees with this. It's always offering reasons why you shouldn't feel sad regardless. You know, There's this everything happens for a reason line, for example, which it isn't specific to the positive thinking movement, but they use it a lot and it's absolutely awful. I mean, it, it's awful in a number of ways, but... Um, <laughs> in terms of a response to seeing a sad person, if if you say, look, don't worry, everything happens for a reason, what you're actually saying to them is, is one of two things. First, the sadness of yours, it's it's not legitimate, it's not justified, you know, because there's a reason, you just are too stupid to get it. Or two, you're actually saying, there's a reason why you're sad, which almost sounds like you deserve to be sad. And, and I think both of these are, are quite cruel and, and horrible messages. But um, I would say that everything happens for a reason isn't, uh, isn't any mantra of uh, a positive thinking movement. I would say that's an age-old phrase and that, yeah, you can link things to that. But I would say um, it might be better to say uh, that you can learn from even negative situations. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact... Let's face it, most of the negative situations in our life or most of the mistakes we made, they're the biggest learning experiences where we, that's where we do learn the most from. So it, it's a very positive way of thinking about a negative situation, but it is, it is actually true. You make I, a mistake and you will, you'll learn something from it, you know? Yeah, I, I agree. But I, I think part of the learning is, uh, is, is to go down through that trough of whoops, I fucked up and, and, and really feel that, you know, uh, that's the that's the impetus for you to to avoid the same mistake next time. Um, mm. But but look, it, PT positive thinking believers say this this kind of stuff to themselves all the time. You know, think positive thoughts, think positive thoughts, and and I think they're cutting themselves off from something that's necessary to our mental health. Um, and look, in psycho in psychological in psychological terms, if you're cutting negative unhappy thoughts out of your psyche, uh, what you're doing is cultivating a state of denial in your mind. Now, this denial thing, it's something which psychologists have studied a lot because they've found that uh, when people confront really unpleasant events in their lives, say a loved one dies or you, you go through a divorce or the end of a, an important relationship, um, when these things happen, there's a denial stage that a lot of people go through. And, and as a temporary thing, uh, it has a real concrete purpose. It's part of the recovery. Uh, you know, things that we need to recover from certain things that, that stop us from functioning and participating normally in our lives. And, and denial is something that can serve us in, in, in these situations. But, but the thing is, it's meant to be temporary. People who get stuck in denial, who are denying their problems, saying everything's working, I'm going to be successful, la 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 la, and, and don't move past that, usually end up, I would say, being very neurotic and unhappy. And they, these, are, these people, in turn, uh, usually have a, a poisonous influence on the others around them because they, they can never accept what's really going on or, or evaluate things honestly. So it's impossible to address any kind of problem with someone who's permanently in denial. They just ignore it or they, they blame everyone else. They're, they're, they're difficult people to deal with. See, yeah, I've, I've never thought of positive thinking uh, in that kind of way, that it is denial. I, I, you know, if something bad happens, I've never thought that um, that sh it should be whitewashed as though something bad isn't happening. I think the acknowledgement, and I think there's a lot of people in a positive mo uh, thinking movement who would acknowledge mm. that, who wouldn't say you deny something bad has happened. It, mm -hmm. you, you accept something's bad's happened, but then you think, what is um, what is the best way out of this situation? And you start thinking positively as, as soon as you can. You know, you know, you can mm -hmm. dwell, you can dwell, you know, w wallow in um, in misery for a while. You know, yeah, it's, it's almost like grieving in a way. You can mm -hmm. do that for a while, but really, you should, as soon as you can, you should start thinking about what's the best way out of this situation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm not, but I, I want to give you an example. 
so there's a there's an author, um, Barbara Ehrenreich. Uh, she has written a book about positive thinking, and not not a congratulatory book. Um, she's very critical of the positive thinking movement, and uh, she she came to this. She was already a published author, but she came to the conclusion that she wanted to write this book after being diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, now. This is a classic story that you hear. You know, the person had had incurable cancer. The positive thinking movement loves this story. Uh, the person had incurable cancer. The doctors had tried everything, no results. The tumor was inoperable. La 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 la. But these people just refused to let themselves let the disease get them down. They stayed positive. They stayed cheerful and said, "I'm not going to die. I've got so much to live for." And then they just mysteriously got better. Yeah. And and somewhere in the story, the word miracle usually turns up, which. I really think is is always a sign that there's there's a lot of lazy thinking going on, yeah, or that someone's trying to scam you. So so positive. Now, now uh, I have to interrupt slightly there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean there are scam artists around, but there are cases of miracles around the world, and and having faith in something, uh, something good to happen has there has been proven cases where that has worked. Now, I don't necessarily think that someone should apply that to every situation, but. I think you That's, could. I think you could find cases for sure where it has worked. And positive thinking in medical conditions, I think, has been scientifically proven to actually have have actually made some people better in some situations. That's that's it. Yeah, but that's exactly the point. Um, I, I read a quote earlier online. I just I just came across it uh, uh, coincidentally um, by yeah, one of the early psychoanalysts. I can't remember Jung or Adler or someone like that. And the quote was. Uh, was um, uh, let your positivity or let your optimism be a character trait. Don't let it become an ideology. No. Um, because I agree. I, I mean, if you if something is as catastrophic as that happens to you, yeah, you can spend the last months of your life being being horribly depressed, or you can you know enjoy and savor the time you have left, and and so on and so on. And of course, that's that's the better way to go about it, you know. But this uh, this author, Erin Reich, uh, she had treatment for breast cancer, but during the treatment, uh, doctors kept saying to her that the key was to think positively. And you know, when you're, you're fighting something as serious and scary as breast cancer, and you're with doctors in white coats with machines next to them, that's not what you want to hear, and it's not always going to be possible to think positive thoughts when something so traumatic is happening to you. So at various times, uh, Ehrenreich expressed her fear and her anger, you know, this, this, this thing that, that people naturally go through when, when they're, they're hit with a terminal illness, you know, why me, why, what did I do to deserve this and so on. And, and these medical professionals lectured her for being so negative, you know, stay positive, everything will be okay. So she went onto the internet and she, she joined lots of forums. Uh, um, started by breast cancer sufferers, and she found that uh, there was a legion of breast cancer sufferers out there who who had slipped into this delusion that that the medical treatment was neither here nor there. That the only way to beat cancer was to stay upbeat. And these women, I mean, there were there were women writing books with names like the gift of cancer. You know, um, <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> sick. It is. <laughs> she found like everybody who posted on forums of breast cancer was, was going on about this positive thinking stuff and no dissent was allowed. So, so she, of course, tried to introduce a different point of view onto some of these forums and, and she was basically told to get lost, go away, you need psychological therapy. So now to me, that that's just grotesque, you know. It is, um, but um, I would say that that's, um, I guess some of the doctors involved in this situation would have probably read studies of people thinking positively and they have and, and, it, and it had had an effect on some illnesses and they had no other options because there's no cure for cancer so it's the only thing they could offer her because what else are they going to offer her there is there is no cure for cancer and that's another subject we can discuss at a later date because I, I believe that um, basically there could have been a cure for cancer by now it's basically there's too much money in it basically Nobody's uh -huh. nobody's properly researching the causes and um, solutions of cancer because nobody wants there to be a cure for cancer. In fact, uh -huh. I think I think there are people that have 
uh, claimed they have found the cure for cancer, but they're being shunned by the medical profession. So it is another subject, but these doctors had nothing to offer. So the only thing they can offer is, is positive thinking. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. That, but, that, I mean, that. I think things like, you know, the book title you mentioned, uh, The Gift of Cancer, <laughs> that's kind of, that's ridiculous. It starts to get it's like like I said at the start it's on a it's on a um, it's on a spectrum and I think for for a lot of the spectrum what you're saying is perfectly true uh, but there's a kind of one end of the spectrum where where as I said it becomes an ideology and then it it, it starts to get creepy yeah you know? it does um, yeah but at the same time if if someone did have cancer like you like you said yourself uh, the positive thing it's not such bad advice because if that person is going to die a year from now. Like you said, what what can you do? Are you going to spend that year thinking negatively, or, can, or do you want to spend it doing everything you ever wanted to do and thinking as positively as possible? Because you're going to have the most possible, uh, the most positive um, year thinking that way. The more positive year than you yeah. are if you think negatively. So there is an there's quite a big element of truth in it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Let Let's um let's talk about uh, um some some case studies which involve uh, visualizations yeah, because mm -hmm. you know positive thinking it's all about goals yeah uh, it's one of these systems that claims it can help you achieve your dreams and uh, I think instinctively when when someone says uh, thinking positive positively will let you achieve your dreams a lot of people would just instinctively say well yeah maybe to an extent but but most Im the most important thing is to think realistically yeah <laughs> so be prepared for success and be prepared for difficulties and um you know when, when you're embarking on something new in life you, you you really need to do this because if you don't then you you're going to invest a lot of emotion or a lot of money or whatever into something that may not work yeah so it turns out that um the the research that's been done on this supports supports the the idea which i think our instinct probably tells us is true like a lot of research you know it kind of tells us what we know um, <laughs> but uh there have been a lot of studies on on things like visualizing your future success and things like this so so the first one uh university of california uh researchers took two groups of students and they asked one group to spend uh, a little time each day visualizing getting a high grade in their upcoming uh, upcoming exams they were asked uh, to create an image in their mind's eye so imagine themselves doing well you know see yourself in the exam you understand all the questions you do a great job then visualize what happens when you get your results the big party the ad you know your parents being proud of you blah 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 um, so they were told to do that every day and then there was a control group who weren't given any visualizations yeah but they, they were just told do whatever you normally do to prepare for an exam but the researchers asked both groups to keep a journal where they noted down how many hours of study they did and this is the interesting bit the visualizations only lasted a few minutes but the students who who did them spent hours less studying and they ended up with lower grades um second study university of, of pennsylvania the researchers uh, talked to females who were dieting and they asked these women to uh, rehearse scenarios in their heads about food related situations so so for example going to a friend's house for dinner and there's lots of food there that that you know you shouldn't eat while you're on this diet or going to a party whatever um so they took any answers but then they categorized them as as Po as uh, positive or negative so if a woman said uh, yeah sure I could be at a party I'd stick to my diet I'd resist every temptation that was categorized as extremely positive whereas if she said I would totally lose the plot you know like after one drink I just eat everything I could see <laughs> that was uh, classified as a, a negative answer again these um these researchers found that the the women with the positive thoughts uh, lost less weight than the ones with the more pessimistic thoughts so that the, the the women who essentially said no no i'm strong i'm strong i'll never i'll never be tempted actually were more so than the ones who who perhaps had a lower opinion of their ability to stick to the diet yeah i i would say um about this uh, these tests there's so many tests there isn't there um there's i think a lot of these people do tests which they already sort of know the outcome so that they can prove a theory that they already uh, that already exists or, or oh. uh, an idea they already have because oh, um, I, I can I can yeah, tell yeah. you um, I can tell you 
another uh, another trial that was done at the University of South Carolina mm -hmm. um, by Barbara Fredrickson. Excellent so, Re research fight. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Fredrickson tested the impact of positive emotions on the brain by setting up an experiment. She divided her research subjects into five groups and showed them different film clips. The first two groups were shown film clips that created positive emotions. Group one, for example, saw images that created uh, feelings of joy. Group two saw images created feelings of contentment. Group mm -hmm. three was a control group. They saw images that were neutral and didn't produce any specific, specific emotion. And the last two groups were shown uh, clips that created negative emotions, uh, creating f uh, images of, uh, that created feelings of fear and feelings of anger. Mm -hmm. um, afterwards, each participant was asked to imagine themselves in a situation uh, where similar feelings would arise and write down what they would do. And uh, now the, um, they, were, they were given pieces of paper to write down uh, what they would do, sort of starting off, for example, I would like to. Um, participants who saw images of fear and anger wrote down the fewest responses, while the partic participants who uh, had seen the images of joy and contentment wrote down a significantly higher number of things that they would do. And so basically, the, the, uh, in other words, when you're experiencing positive emotions of joy, contentment, love, you're going to see more possibilities. Uh -huh. That's what the um, the outcome of this. So basically, I, I was just sort of, I only said that just to show you that you know anyone can make a trial and and come up with a, an outcome because that's what these scientists do, don't they? Yeah, no, it makes and it, it makes sense in a way. If you're in a positive frame of mind, then you're more geared to coming up with strategies. So Absolutely, and I, and I think yeah. that is the strength of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. that it, when you start thinking positively, you do start um, to have more ideas about how to get yourself out of a negative situation. Mm -hmm. But I don't think you should. You mentioned about visualization. Yeah. Um, I think the problem with your example about the um, passing the exams, mm. I, I don't think the visualization is particularly successful when you set a deadline. When you say this has got to happen on this particular date, mm -hmm. what it's got to be is something like your second example where someone was trying to lose weight. Uh, is, is is not to say I'm going to lose weight by this day and visualize it and, and uh, basically just visualize what's going to happen, the outcome, but don't set a deadline because you may not do it um, in three weeks, you may not do it in four, but if you constantly, if you have visualized how you're going to look at a certain point, um, then you can eventually achieve it. It's like you've been in the boxing ring, you know, you're going to get uh -huh. knocked down, there's going to be setbacks, but you can still achieve that visualization of you in the, in a slim state. I think that the danger is, uh, I, I don't disagree with you, but I think the danger is that if you put too much emphasis on this, you can get lost in your visualization. So I sort of agree with Anthony on some of his points. And there is a danger that we deny that we're feeling bad and that things need addressing. But um, we're going to talk about that more in part two, which will be on next week's episode with Sheila Zielinski. Uh, let us know what you think though, go to the chat room, leave a voicemail, vote. Um, anyway, remember blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth. Albert Einstein. Uh, just remind us about donations button which is on the about section of the Truth Sentinel YouTube channel. That's the one that's called Truth Sentinel, not Truth Sentinel 2, not any of the other sites that put up vi our videos which we're quite happy for people to do. Um, and you'll find the voicemail section on there as well. Just just have a quick check. Go to YouTube, type in Truth Sentinel, make sure you know where the right the real channel is. Okay. Um, but we do thank people who are supporting us um, for putting up our videos as well. Basically, just a quick reminder regarding the T-shirts. Um, Twenty-eight pounds uh, donation will get you a T-shirt. Send me. Um, an email before if you'd like. If you want to do that before you make a donation, fine. I can I can just give you more details, basically. All I need to know is your address, uh, your size. I've got small, medium, large, and extra large. The Ukrainian, these are made in Ukraine, okay? So we're trying to support the economy over there as well. And um, the sizes are quite small. So if you're normally um, a large, you might want to go for extra large. If you're if you usually buy a medium, you might want to get a large instead. So send me your address, your size, 
And then um, you can do that before you make a donation. Once I get confirmation, I'll send you a T-shirt. Um, also, we've teamed up with a another T-shirt company, not the same one where we get our T-shirts made in Ukraine, but another company. The name is Truth T-shirts, and that's from truthtshirts.com. Now we've made, we've um, made an agreement with them that any T-shirt you buy there, uh, Truth Sentinel listeners get a ten percent discount. You need to type in a code. Um, I don't know whether it's case sensitive, but it's truth one, truth in capital letters one. So the code is truth one, and you get your ten percent discount. And they will also donate two pounds fifty to Truth Sentinel channel. So you get ten percent discount, and you make a donation. You get a political T-shirt which lets people around you know the way you're thinking and where you stand. And I think this is part of the thing we can do is to let people realize that there's people out other people out there questioning the truth and the more and more people they see the more i think other people will come out and start questioning as well they they also do customized t-shirts if you're going on a protest march or something and they're quite reasonably priced i mean they're cheaper than our our truth Tech sentinel t-shirts um i mean i'm only saying 28 pounds because that sort of includes a donation as well to truth sentinel by the way their t-shirts quite a lot of them under the £20 mark anyway and they've got quite a, a choice I'll be putting up some photos on this episode as well as political photos uh, and political things that I've been sending out on Twitter uh, during the week when I have time I send out political messages on Twitter and um, I thought a good way of using them again is to put them up on the episode let me know what you think though because like I said before and I do mean it this is a community channel and if you don't like those those uh, things that I'm putting up then just let me know and I'll take them down and uh, let me know also how you think this channel could be improved things we could do we're basically about spreading tolerance looking for a peaceful yet revolutionary change to make a better society addressing issues that we uh, we see at the moment such as missing planes um, um, honor killings um, things like that you know things that we can try and affect anyway Okay, thanks again to Kieran P with his promotion efforts and appreciate any help any of you can give in to make making this channel more popular, more more listeners, spreading the message out, doing publicity stunts. We need to get a different way of thinking out to a wider audience, to tens of thousands really. I'm not doing this just as an entertainment. I'm certainly not doing it for money. We make a loss at the moment. And I really feel that the world is in a dire situation and we need to do something about it. Anyway, don't forget to come and say hi, leave a voicemail, or email me scottsentinel9 at gmail.com for any reason. If you want to say hello, if you want to leave a comment, if you want to come on as a guest, if you want to suggest a guest. Uh, topics coming up in future episodes could include Fukushima, Chernobyl, missing persons, time travel, the Dyatlov Pass incident, religious cults. Utopia, Revelations, End Times, Noah's Ark, um, all kinds of things basically. Other shows that we listen to, Hagman and Hagman, Freeman Fly, Mark Cockin, John Gary, David Icke, Pete Wicker, Sheila Zielinski, who's going to be joining us next episode. Please contact us for um, any sponsorship, any advertisers, um, scottcentral9 at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week. Catch you later. Goodbye.